The History of the Sanctuary of Pompeii, Part 8. 3. False Beginnings and Their Lamentable Consequences. Thus the first pile of stones was made, with which to begin the foundations of the Church of Pompeii. And another example of the zealous custodian was followed by proprietors of stone quarries, by lime vendors, and by teamsters, so that nothing more was lacking, and digging could be begun. The hand was laid to the spade, and the ground was broken. But in order to present to our readers a clearer idea of the difficulties we had to encounter, it will not be out of place for us to give a description of the volcanic nature of the land that was to receive the foundations. In this portion of the valley it is in layers, and the upper soil is not deeper than a yard, indeed in some parts less. This is formed by ashes from Vesuvius, thrown out in the years following the great eruption of 79. It had been rendered most fertile by the constant industry of the peasants, assisted by frequent irrigations due to the canal and the river Sarno, so that this warm soil, refreshed by copious streams, readily yields the patient cultivator four harvests a year. But beneath this very fertile layer there lies another hard and sterile, formed of ashes and iron kneaded together with the boiling water ejected from Vesuvius in the famous year 79. It was in this subsoil that the modern Pompeians were accustomed to lay the foundations of their houses. Beneath this tasso, as the geologists call it, lies buried a stratum of lapilli, small white stones, light and porous as sponges, and that nevertheless su sufficed to bury a vast city entirely. Such was the quantity that rained down from the fiery mountain, destroying the pagan abode of luxury and pro profligacy. This layer of lapilli is from three or four yards deep, and is, from time to time, interspersed with others of tasso, about half a yard deep. This deep stratum of lapilli rests on the soil once cultivated by the ancient Pompeians, which is reddish and fertile. Various objects of interest have come to be discovered in this substratum of, of earth near Pompeii. Coins, skeletons of birds, and the skeleton of a slave, to judge from the chains on his ankles. From the state in which the soil was found, it was easy to infer the mode of cultivation on the ancient Pompeians, who divided the ground in broad strips, intersecting them with little canals such as can be seen to this day in the swampy lands near Naples. Beneath the lapilli, sometimes in the middle of them, are to be found veins of water, in some parts most fresh and drinkable, in others iron and magnesia abound in excess. And now, having given an idea of the geological formation of these parts, let us return to our history. Joseph Federico, who was an enterprising man and experienced in business matters, having observed that the master masons of Scafati demanded higher pay than those in Boscatric case, a master mason of that town, Luigi Curillo, by name, was called in to commence the foundations of the new church. But Curillo, not thinking of the weight that these would be called upon it to bear, sunk them only two and a half fars deep into the second layer of Cas Tasso before described. Being quite uncertain as to whether or not we were doing the right thing with regard to the building, we felt absolutely obliged to consult an architect 
and the countess, knowing an old engineer in Naples, Sig Francesco Aratore, a most pious man, architect of the new home, Miss Catherine Volpicelli, had had built for the Sisters of the Sacred Heart. We one evening went out to call on him. As soon as he heard the manner, our manner of proceeding, he greatly marveled at our not having consulted a competent authority on the subject. We besought him to come to Valle di Pompei for a day, at least, and to examine the freshly opened foundations. But he excused himself, alleging his old age and infirmities, but offering to send in his stead his young assistant. Two days afterwards, the latter came to Pompeii to look at the excavations already begun. Needless to say that he was completely disapproved of all that had been done. Your foundation pilasters, he remarked, if you wished them to be solid and firm must be settled below the water. It was therefore necessary to undo what had already been begun and to dig down still further and to place the vaults underground so as to render them immovable. For a church destined to contain two thousand people, the pilasters were weak and the arches too superficial. Time, at least, if not money, had been wholly wasted. This was a sore trial for our hearts and, as is the usual with every one whose peace of mind is disturbed, we begin to consider to whom we should turn to unburden our cares and anxieties. It seemed to us that no one could better comfort us than the Bishop of Nola. To him, therefore, we immediately sent the Don, the priest Don Gennaro to inform him minutely of all that has occurred. The good bishop, at first, was taken sadly by surprise, and not knowing what course to choose, he remarked, Suspend all work until I send you Master Salvador. He will decide what is to be done, and then I will come in person to the valley of Pompeii. 4. Disappointment Salvatore Taddeo was a mason of Nola, some seventy, nearer seventy than sixty years of age, a man of integrity and experience in his trade. Therefore, Monsignor Formisano had had recourse to his services in restoring part of the seminary. Such was the esteem in which he held him that the worthy prelate never began any building without first having recourse to his old and trusted mason. On the other hand, such was the veneration Tadeo felt for the old bishop, that he never dissented a jot or tittle from the latter's opinions. On the day fixed, we all, together, we all gathered together in the brink of the excavations, the countess and myself, the Frederico family, father and sons, the master mason of Bosco Tritcase, Luigi Carrillo, and Master Salvador, the chief oracle. It may please the reader to hear the conversation held on this occasion, as it will go to prove still further how the sanctuary of Pompeii, had it been the work of man alone, would still to this day not have arisen above its foundations. What say you, Master Salvador? Are these foundations well laid? I asked. Oh, yes, quite well. But the assistant of the architect of Signor Aratori had observed that they are superficial, and hence should be relayed. Well, yes, they are superficial. But are you of the opinion that by laying pillars deeper we should be more sure to build well? Oh, yes, perhaps it would be better to do so. But it is not the fear of our bishop well-founded, namely that an eruption of Vesuvius would cause the building to collapse with such foundations. Yes, there is a danger that Vesuvius might be the cause of a catastrophe. Then would it not be any wiser to lay the foundations in concrete? 
In that case, would an interruption be destructive to the building? No, then there would be no fear of danger. How are we to decide upon the length and width of the concrete foundation? His lordship had told us to build by piecemeal. Two walls now, next year add another one, and so on year by year, as Providence sends us the money. What say you? That would be well, too. One was obliged to exercise so much self-control as not to lose the little patience still remaining. In order not to offend the old mason, I laughingly changed the subject and made a sign to my companions, turned away from the broken-up ground and left for Naples, most sadly disappointed at heart. Five. How Professor Antonio Cua of the University of Naples offered to gratuitously direct the building of the sanctuary. While I was thus sorely tried and embarrassed, God, who was providentially guiding the threads of his own work, drew me from my perplexity in a most surprising manner. I went to the house of the Cavalier Tarquinio Furortes, an intimate friend of mine and professor of mathematics in the military college of Nunci Nunciatella. He, though young in years, possessed such artistic taste and knowledge, and his noble and sincere characteristics are to be greatly re admired. It is needless to say that he and all his family had been amongst our first associates in the schemes connected with the future church of Pompeii. The morning I went to call on him, I found him surrounded by his family and friends, amongst them an elderly gentleman of venerable mien, wholly unknown to me. Nothing could be more desirable to me than to find strangers in the homes of my friends as I was thus offered the chance of finding new subscribers to the Church of Pompeii. And so, preoccupied solely with my all-absorbing thought, and without waiting for introductions, I began to relate to my friend all that had recently happened to me in the Valley of Pompeii. The stranger, after listening to me for a while, interrupted me by saying, Pray, who is the architect who directs your works? Oh, answered I, with a smile and shaking my head, we have no architects. What? exclaimed the gentleman, greatly surprised. For the church you are building, in laying the foundations, you have no architect to guide you. You at least have an architectural design? Oh, that, yes, I answered. And, pray who designed it? We ourselves. That is to say, a young friend of mine, a priest, who copied it from a plan of a church nearby. I should like to see the drawing, remarked the stranger with a certain air of superiority, as, as of a master towards a delinquent scholar. And I, who always carried my dra drawing with me, ready at any moment to show it, put my hand into this pocket and drew forth the famous paper my readers already know. As soon as the gentleman beheld the drawing, a smile of compassion overspread his features. But why, inquired he, is an undertaking of this kind not have recourse to a person co competent in this manner? Because the fees and expenses of an architect would absorb half the money collected with so much difficulty. Oh, that is an exaggeration, answered the stranger, becoming serious. Moreover, there might be some architects who would lend their services gratuitously. I would never accept the offer, I said interruptingly. The Bishop of Nola, Marcioni Fila Filiasi, and Father Ludovico of Casoria found themselves in a heap of trouble on that very account. We must distinguish facts, gravely remarked the stranger, not all men are alike, nor all cases either. 
Give me your drawing and I will make it anew for you according to the rules of architecture. I, who was intensely prejudiced through ignorance and inexperience against all architects, and had not the slightest idea as to who the gentleman was, felt quite taken aback by his pro proposal to make me an artistic drawing gratuitously. I almost feared I was being made fun of, and looked most significantly at my friend Tarquinio. He understood me, and exclaimed, Bartolo, this gentleman is the Cavalier Antonio Cua, an, il an illustrious professor of mathematics at the Royal University of Naples. He is one of the best men in the world. He offers to lend you his gratuitous services. Rest assured you will have a satisfactory plan. This to me was like a revelation, and slightly bow bowing my head I whispered, Providence has led me to meet an engineer who is the senior professor of the university, for it seemed to me that heaven had lent me a visible sign of its protection. I felt quite overcome. Here indeed, thought I, is a thread God had placed in my hand, without even my seeking it. Thus while thinking, I uttered a few words of thanks. I felt quickly impelled to speak on the merit there must be in God's sight for anyone who builds a temple to the Lord, and cited the wonders performed in a short time by the Virgin of Pompeii, in favor of those who had helped towards this work of charity and salvation. Professor Kua, whose heart was as noble as his mind, exclaimed, Well, as you are building a church for poor peasants, and with pennies not easily collected, I not only will give you the design, but I shall myself, and without any remuneration whatsoever, superintend the work of the building at Pompeii. When I go to and fro, the cost of traveling will be mine. Beside myself with joy, I immediately wrote as follows to Valet. Dear Don Gennaro, Suspend all work. The Lord has stretched forth his hand to help me. He has brought me in contact with an in engineer, a learned professor at the university, who has offered to direct the building of the church without fee or compensation. And what is more generous still, he does not even wish to have his traveling expenses refunded. It is, therefore, plain that the Lord assists us visibly. Let us take the courage. I shall come to Valle next week. In the meantime, our undertaking is to be announced from the pulpits of some of the churches in Naples, where larger con congregations assemble. Fare you well. Yours, Bartolo Longo. Thus at last a substantial beginning was given to the building of the temple, which was within so short a time to rise, a very marvel of beauty and splendor. Chapter 2 June 8, 1876 The first apparition of the Virgin of Pompeii, Madame Giovanni, Booty. Meanwhile, I left no stone unturned, still further to spread information regarding the work that has been undertaken in Pompeii among the Neapolitan people. But Providence itself, as ever, was my best coadjutor. It was the first of June of that same year, 1876. The Countess and I were visiting many different Neapolitan families to collect the monthly penny subscriptions in order to continue the building of the foundations. Of all our friends and acquaintances, we asked the names and addresses of good and generous persons who would be willing to subscribe a penny a month. Among others, 
we were told to apply to a wealthy and charitable family, La Geza by name, residing in Via Street, Thither we bent our footsteps. This was on the 6th of June. But, kindly as the ladies received us, on hearing our request, they seem unable to credit our statements, and to prevent further inopportunity, exclaimed, It is impossible to build a church on penny subscriptions, as much as to say, abandon such utopian ideas. Then, in order to win them over to our side, we began telling them of the various wonders performed by the Virgin of the Rosary, in favor of those who helped in the work with these simple penny subscriptions. Oh, if Our Lady would but vouchsafe to perform a wonder, exclaimed Madame Caroline, mother of the family, today would be the time to manifest her power. Our good friend Madame Giovannina Muti has left our house in the most critical state of health to go to the Vill Villa Doria on the Vomero, and the owner of the house, knowing that she must die of consumption there, has, is, has inserted in the contract that payment must be obligatory for three years. Upon the decease of the lady, the whole apartment will have to be renovated at the expense of the family. Her physician has today told us there is no hope for her. All her friends, and we among them, are oppressed with this sorrow. Her affectionate husband, Ferdinand Muti, is inconsolable. She will leave behind her five orphaned children. If this be so, we answered, Tell your friend to have recourse to the Virgin of the Rosary, who, for the building of her church in Pompeii today, grants most singular favors. If you only knew, interrupted one of the ladies, how many vows her husband has made, how many gifts he has presented to various churches, and all in vain, he has now lost all hope. We ask no vows or gifts, we answer. Induce your friend to try what others have tried so efficaciously. Here is a sheet of paper for promoters. So saying, I drew forth and placed beneath the lady's eyes a sheet of printed paper bearing this simple headline for a temple in Pompeii. Let the patient inscribe her name at the head of the page with the small offering of a sou a month for the new temple of Mary and seek to find the other subscribers. In other words, let her begin to act as a promoter of Our Lady, who never fails to recompense all those who labor for her, and at the same time, promise to publish the miracle should it be granted her. That same evening the Misses Lageza sent a letter to their dying friend, beseeching her to vow herself to the miraculous Virgin of the Rosary of Pompeii, and making her promise to inscribe herself as promoter of the new church there to be elected. Madame Giovanni Muti, ni Sabato, lay indeed at death's door. Such indeed was the state of her health that not only had her doctor given up every vestige of hope, but many had already thought her to be deceased. It was in this sad condition of things that the poor lady received the letter written her by the Mrs. Legeza. On reading the lines of her friends in the program of the Church of Pompeii, enclosed in the letter, her heart was deeply touched, and she immediately wrote her name on the subscription sheet, then called her mother, her maid, and so on all her family. And such was the sudden faith she felt in her heart, scarce had she written her name, that from that very moment she felt sure of the desired miracle. It was the eighth day of June. 
but a month had elapsed since Our Lady had, with a smile of blessing, looked down upon the humble valley of Pompeii, where a work had been begun that heaven and earth alike were to lay their hand to. Madame Muti fell into a slumber, during which she seemed to behold the Virgin of the Rosary seated on a throne, with her infant on her arms and the rosary in her hands, but without a diadem on her brow. It was thus, indeed, that the Virgin was depicted in the old painting renovated in Pompeii. But of this fact the invalid knew nothing, as she had never beheld the picture. It seemed to her that the Virgin gazed most tenderly upon her, while she besought her with tears and groans to free her from her sufferings, and to obtain her recovery from her div divine son. And while weeping she pointed, being unable to speak, to the babe, as though imploring her health through the intercession of the Virgin. When, lo and behold, the merciful Mother Mary smile, and look at her steadily, and throw a white ribbon to her, on which were written some words, which she hastened to read, the Virgin of the Rosary of Pompeii has granted her request to the invalid Giovannina Muti. O oh, Mother of the Rosary, O oh, Mother, I hope so, sayest thou true. Shall I indeed be spared? Will I not die? Thus she spoke in her vision. The vision vanished. She scarce could believe herself. It all appeared to her in a dream. But she had not been, but it had not been a dream, for she had heard the words and the movements of the people who were in the adjoining room. Was it then really an apparition of the Virgin of the Rosary? But how was she to explain the fact of the Virgin of the Rosary being seated and without a diadem on her brow, whereas she is always depicted everywhere standing, in a queenly attitude, and with the royal diad diadem on her brow? That meant, then, this usual, unusual attitude. The poor invalid could find no answer to these questions. Yet, nevertheless, she felt as though new life throbbed in her veins. She felt elated as though with a sudden and intense joy. Her emotion did not allow her to relate what had occurred, and yet how hard hide it. Why not rejoice the hearts of her dear ones with the rays of a hope they no longer felt? Taking courage, she called to all to surround her, and then related her vision. Instantly all fever and the obstinate cough disappeared. While the fortunate woman was still relating, with growing warmth and vividness, what had happened to her, Ferdinando Muti returned home. As soon as the latter beheld his wife, whom he already wept as dead, seated in bed and conversing with a voice never interrupted by that suffocating cough, and telling of the strange occurrence, overcome by emotion, he flew downstairs to the stables, mounted a horse, and dashed off towards Naples to learn all the facts of the case from the ladies' legaza. On entering their room, he fell on his knees before Madame Carolina, and, moved to tears, thus spoke, You have restored unto me my wife, and forthwith he told them of the vision, and of the sudden improvement, asking at the same time the meaning of the words, Virgin of Pompeii. The pious Mrs. Legeza, quite overcame with the surprise, could offer him no other explanation than the visit of two strangers who had come to solicit subscriptions for a so a month for a church to be built in Pompeii and to be dedicated to the Virgin of the Rosary. Nothing else did they add, nor say that the Virgin in the image was not crowned, and the like. But there the fact was. Madame Muti had seen the Virgin, Virgin, as she was depicted in Pompeii, and from a dying condition had 
instantaneously return to new life. Full of holy joy, the Mrs. Legeza, feeling that the Madonna had made use of them to accomplish a miracle, hastened to give notice of what had happened to Reverend Father Altavia, who they had heard a few days before pronounce from the pulpit of the Church of St. Domenico Soriano words of enthusiasm concerning a Catholic church in Pompeii to be erected with monthly subscriptions of a sou. Father Altavia, rejoiced at hearing such glad news, hastened to inform the Countess and myself. Thus all three of us, on June 31st, betook ourselves to the v Villa Dior Doria on the v Vomero to hear the marvelous tale from the lips of the invalid, and Madame Muti, most frankly, like a person in perfect health, repeated the facts to us. On August 30th, the fortunate lady returned to Naples, completely cure and free from all ailments, arousing universal wonder in all who knew her. With her own hand she wrote the history of the case, and Father Altavilla read the same to a number, numerous congregation in the Church of St. Nicholas of Tolentino. Madame Muti's mother offered fifty francs towards the building of the temple. Her son, Pietro Muti, a priest's cape, a silver lamp and pyx, inscribed with the name of Giovannini Muti, are kept in the sanctuary as a perpetual memory of the first apparition of Our Lady of the Rosary, under her new title of Virgin of Pompeii, apparition that took place on the eighth day of June, 1876, a month after laying of the cornerstone of the Temple of Mary. Madame Muti is still living today, nineteen years after that date, and all who visit her and knew how she was on the brink of the grave cannot refrain from marveling and praising God. And nothing rejoices her more than to relate the miracle received and attributed to the most miraculous Virgin of the Rosary of Pompeii. Chapter 3 An Offering for the First Altar Madame Rachel de Hippolytus It was evident, then, that Heaven wished to encourage and strengthen us and teach us to stand firm whatever seeming adversities and contrarieties might arise. And, behold, before the expiration of the month of June, Mary granted still other favors and graces. Amongst the pious listeners to Father Altavia, in the church of San Domenico Soriano on the morning of May 24th, was a certain gentlewoman, Rachel de Hippolytus by name, who resided in Via Espiritu di Palazzo, number 41. Her son lay gravely ill with a complication of diseases, on hearing from the lips of the fervent orator that the Virgin had lavished daily favors upon all those who took an interest in the new church in Pompeii, she felt new hope kindle within her, and said to herself, Oh, if the Virgin of the Rosary of Pompeii would but give me back my son, I would offer a thousand francs with which to build the first altar of that church. And the And the Queen of Mercies poured her heavenly balsam on the sore heart of the afflicted mother. Madame de Hipp Hippolytus had not yet returned home, and her son was already out of danger, and in a short time he was restored to perfect health. But the love of a mother, when the health of her children is in question, is always dubious and inclined to fear the worst. Thus, Madame de Hippolytus cannot believe her own eyes. She is in constant dread of a bitter disillusion, 
She wants to ascertain whether the recovery of her son will be able to brave and withstand the rigors of the following winter. So she allowed the year 1876 and all of winter 1877 to roll by, but when next May returned and still found her son enjoying perfect health, she felt the sting of remorse for not having sooner kept her promise to Our Lady, and decided in her heart to repair, to repair her failing generously. I will not only give a thousand francs, thus spoke she to herself, but the interest on the same for, for a year, one hundred and fifty francs, besides. And so as to render still more signal witness to the favor received, she went personally to Nola, and placed the sum of one thousand one hundred and fifty francs in the hands of the venerable bishop, with the request that he send them to the founders of the temple for the first altar to be built in the church of, Ros of Rosary of Pompeii. Chapter 4. The Foundations Strengthened Towards the first days of July, the illustrious professor, professor Antonio Cua betook himself for the first time to Pompeii, carrying with him the architectural drawing of the new church, which had been obliged to accommodate the dimensions fixed by me with the excavation of the first foundations. First of all, he showed us the great error of building an edifice, especially the foundations, by piecemeal. If you next year should lay a new foundation and on them construct a new portion of building, you will find that in joining the new construction to the old, they will separate. For the first part is bu built will naturally settle before the new building part which when in its turn comes to settle will naturally draw away from the older portion and thus inevitably produce a damage. It was therefore necessary to open all the foundations at once, and as they were to bear an enormous weight, for the stones to be used in the building were volcanic, it was but prudent to construct them of solid masonry. Those already built were solidified so as to render them perfectly secure. But for the execution of his design he needed a more able mason. Hence Pasquale Vitiello, the master mason of Scafati, who had measured the church of Our Lady of the Maroli with me, was recalled. Work on the church was resumed under the direction of engineer Cavalier Cua on the 10th of August of that year, and up to that date, a thousand two hundred francs had been spent, besides the gratuitous gifts of stones, mortar, and, and labor. Chapter 5 the first feast within the enclosure of the foundations. Six months had not yet elapsed from the day of the laying of the cornerstone of the new temple, and already the fountains of the house of the Lord had been laid. Toward the middle of October, the super, superfides of the great underground mason work had already reached the level on which the holy habitation was to rise, and the whitewashed surface performed, formed a pleasing contract to the dark earth laying about it. The reader will remember that for four years past I had never allowed the month of October to go by without festing the Queen of the Rosary with the peasant folk of the valley. Therefore it was more than ever right and just to celebrate her festivity now, and within that rough enclosure. The feast was to consist principally of offering to God the first sacrifice on that land brought for the manifestation of his glory. Two barrels were placed at the further extremity, and across them were laid planks covered with linen and drapery. Thus an altar similar to the one elect 
erected on the eighth day of May, was improvised. On it were placed a crucifix, six candles, and sacred stones. Above the altar, against a background of white and blue draperies, hung the old image, not yet retouched by Maldarelli, and hence not very pleasing to the sight, but dear indeed to me as the signal of victory, and by many venerated as a source of divine consolations. The feast was ordered for the last Saturday of the month, which fell on the twenty-ninth. Fair indeed was that morning on which the Queen of the Most Holy Rosary was feted for the first time by her children, on the spot chosen by herself, as her new dwelling-place, as a throne of her mercies. On the area of the growing sanctuary, on that land where in days of yore the, de the, de the demon had been adored, Beneath a hub humble tent, the bloodless sacrifice of expiation and the love to the true and living God was for the first time offered up. Round about in the open country, scattered over with volcanic stones, stood a motley crowd of nobles and plebeians who had come from Naples and the outlying towns, and who, in the presence of the venerable Bishop of Nola, devoutly recited the fifteen decades of the Most Holy Rosary of Mary. The sacred orator, whom I invited to preach during that strange yet poetical service, celebrated by the side of a provincial highway, was the same Father Altavia, who had by his sermons aroused such a flame of devotion in Naples towards the Virgin of Pompeii. With the most tender words of love and f faith, the eloquent or orator recalled the perennial triumph of the cross over barbarism, over heresy and paganism, and as constant companion of every new victory, Mary, sweet mother of mankind. He observed how she had not chosen a great deal, a great and populous city, in which to be duly honored, but had wished to plant her seat in a barren country, on Gentile land, among the toiling children of the soil. Oh, all those who were present in that hour did indeed taste of the ineffable joys that true religion imparts to the soul. Opposite rose Mount Vesuvius, with its towering crest of smoke, but to the left of the amphitheatre was its ruins of pagan civilization, and behind the same all the broken remains of a dead city still bearing the imprint of its Gentile customs, beneath our eyes an enclosure of mason work still damp with the early autumn rains, and there beneath our gaze a crucifix that has the power to renovate and restore all things, and above it another image, the dear, sweet image, image of the mother of the crucified, and mother of the redeemed as well. Precious tears course down the cheeks of the listeners. Those tears were the words of a believer's heart speaking to God in a voice of mingled love and sorrow. It was the voice of sorrow at the sight of so many modern impieties and heresies. It was the voice of love and gratitude to God, who deigns to accept for his glory the works of man, and openly marks his acceptance of them by means of the miracles granted at the invocation of the Virgin of the Rosary of Pompeii. Such was the impulse of love and faith aroused in that hour in the hearts of all that the holy bishop of Nola himself, unable to master his emotions, descended from his seat, and placing himself in the midst of the people, with burning words exhorted them to the Catholic faith, and intoned the Apostles' Creed, in which all present joined him. O oh, our religion! in the grandeur of its truth is indeed surrounded 
with enchanting beauty. Chapter 6 The Year 1876 That feast marked the close of the first year of the origin of the sanctuary, as it was against the interest of economy to build during the winter when the days are short and rains and storms frequent, but all the more so as I paid the workmen by the day. Besides which the Countess and I spent the winter months in an effort to procure new associates. I find in my primitive registers that up to the 15th of November I had spent 7,370 francs and 10 centimes. Now the amount of the offerings collected was 4,945 francs and 85 centimes. Hence there was a deficit of 2,434 francs and 35 centimes to pay for stones, mortar, and so forth. On the day of the feast I exposed a tablet bearing the names of all contributors and the amount of their contribution, besides the sum total of both income and outlay, signed by Engineer Chevalier Antonio Cua. At sight of the great difference between my income and my outlay, outlay, the good Bishop of Nola was greatly taken aback and remonstrated with me, recalling his precept never to spend more than one has in hand. But as far back as that time I felt within me a strength and vigor which certainly were not natural, for while my body was weak and feeble because of severe infirmities sustained, my spirit was dominated by a holy enthusiasm which allowed me but to think of the temple of the Lord in Pompeii. I beheld it rise, pure and holy in my mind's eye, and the profound conviction laid hold on me that it was God's will a church should rise on that spot and that hence were men willing or not, nothing could impede his designs. And so I quickly tranquilized the prudent prelate by assuring him that I gladly took the debt and all other debts that come upon my own shoulders, sure that heaven would not have forsaken me. From that day to this I have unflinchingly followed that line of conduct, Results prove that I was right. Certainly I was acting most contrary to the dictates of human prudence, but I reasoned thus, not according to the worldly philosophy, but according to that of the saints. When from the start God reveals himself in an undertaking by an extraordinary intervention, and that by the voice of miracles, then, through his infinite goodness and in ineffable mercy, the man whom he places at the head of his works becomes an instrument of his providence, and he inspires him, together with a great desire of good, with a certainty of success. Neither does he allow him to, to be frightened by obstacles, but invigorates him with the vision of the final outcome. Thus it was that through mere divine mercy I took no need in those days of men's judgments of me and of my undertaking, which naturally, according to mere appearances, seemed strange to say the least, or the result of religious enthusiasm. The events of that memorable year alone influenced me from that moment, realizing that I was but an instrument in the carrying out of a divine design, I fixed my eyes unflinchingly on him, whose work I felt it to be, and trod the path laid out for me, hoping all things from above. In the second volume of this history of this sanctuary, the reader will easily gather how well-founded was my faith, and on beholding the works of the Lord, will realize 
how small and insignificant art man and his plans. Then truly will his heart exult, and he will acclaim with the psalmist, Come and behold ye the works which the Lord have wrought.